Okay, so now we are all ready. So, well, first of all, thank you very much Mike, for accepting this invitation. It's, um, it's uh, very exciting to have you here and to have the opportunity of having this conversation. Uh, it is a conversation that you and me have been having for many, many years. And uh, I'm very happy to continue the conversation and to share it with all these um, really audience and, uh, and people. So it's all yours. It's in your hands. So, Karen. Thanks, Angela. We, we have indeed been having this conversation for many years, and tonight is the night that I win. <laughs> 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 There we go. Let me get out on the screen. Hmm. Right. Well, well, welcome everybody. I shall do my best to um, uh, talk about this topic, the uh, the solar viable system model, which actually was a, a topic that I addressed. First of all, in, in an article in 1992 uh, called this, the Solar Viable System Model, uh, and looked at uh, what the viable system model could do for positivism, interpretivism, and uh, structuralism. Uh, at that time, I thought it was a, a vehicle of a, a structural uh, theoretical persuasion. I thought that was the most convincing um, uh, way of employing the viable system model, most cons consistent and coherent way uh, of employing the model. Uh, and I don't differ much from that conclusion now, although I have, I hope, uh, made the, make the argument a bit more sophisticated. So I'm, I'm aware, of course, that it's a model, the viable system model, uh, and therefore it can be used in support of any theoretical position, and, and therefore in support of any uh, methodology which is seeking to put into effect a theoretical position, either to learn from or, or to change something on the basis of. So the, the real question is, is which, for me, is uh, which theoretical position allows the viable system model to best realise its potential uh, a, a, as a model. So if, if, we, if we use it uh, in, in the service of a positivistic approach, is it very useful? Uh, same with interpretivism, same with structuralism. And we could ask the question about an emancipatory approach as well. Now, I, I don't actually want to do that tonight. Um, uh, I, I think it's worthy of discussion in its own right. And I, I'd be certainly willing to partake in that. Um, uh, to me, the, just to, to very quickly, it, it, it can, uh, as a model, point out abuses of power in organisations and it can point you to where those occur. Uh, and, and of course, it is uh, extremely, uh, can be used extremely in an emancipatory fashion uh, in, a, in a, if you like, a, a progressive arena. Uh, John Walker's examples in workers' cooperatives and, of course, the work in Allende's Chile. Where it was, uh, where it's used in, in terms of a progressive, um, a progressive agenda. So it, it has that uh, capacity to support uh, progressive thinking uh, uh, in the right in the right context. Whether it's uh, uh, whether it, to what extent it can support a call for emancipation or lead a reform or revolution, whatever you want, is a, is a different question. I think I'd like to leave that one aside for now. So I'll go through each of these uh, and present my case of what the viable system model can do for positivism, interpretivism and structuralism uh, and where therefore I feel uh, it uh, realises its potential best. So which of these theoretical approaches draws the most from, uh, draws the best out of the viable system model? <coughs> uh, positivism um, Positivism seeks objective knowledge uh, based upon da data derived from experience. It's uh, often characterized as an empiricism. Uh, you, you observe 
uh, the world, in this case, systems in the world and their structures, you, you analyze them uh, and you classify the characteristics of, uh, of systems. Um, an example of that, I think, in the systems domain that might help, help make it clear how you would proceed uh, if you were positivistically inclined is contingency theory, which is a very popular approach uh, in, in system thinking in the 60s and 70s. <clears throat> this whole huge text called Systems and Contingency Approach. And, and what contingency theory tried to do on an empirical basis uh, was to, to, to get data uh, and provide a statistical analysis of, of the relationships between, if you like, surface elements of organizations. So if they had a certain type of technology that you could measure, uh, what kind of structure gave best system performance was a question that uh, Woodward, if I remember rightly, asked. The Aston School were concerned with what type of structure uh, was appropriate for different sizes of organization to yield the best performance. Uh, and the environment, Burns and Stalker, what, what kind of structure was best in a, in a um, stable environment and, and what was best in an unstable environment. And they believed that these things could be measured uh, statistically. Uh, and that for me is the exemplar in systems theory of a positivistic uh, systems approach. Uh, I don't think that the viable system model uh, is, of, is of that type. Uh, for those three reasons there. So I don't think it corresponds particularly well to uh, positivism. Uh, first of all, uh, Stafford Beer is in his discussions of the model and um, many of you in your discussions of the model uh, see systems, boundaries and purposes observer dependent. They're, they're not simply there to be recognized uh, in the world. Uh, uh, and therefore, it, it, the, the VSM is not a representational model in the way that you would expect, in the way that contingency theory sought to, sought to be. Um, uh, there's a good distinction that obviously originates with Maturana and Varela between and, organization and structure, uh, which I think helps here. Uh, structure being, again, related to more surface, surface elements of a uh, of, of, of a system in their view that the things that can change uh, even uh, even while maintaining the same organization uh, an organization which is the key to um, uh, in in their terms um, autopoiesis or in, in Stafford Beer's terms to uh, viability uh, and the VSM is concerned with, of course, with organization, not with surface structure. And, and positivism is concerned with surface structure and not with organization. So uh, not a very good match. And um, uh, the viable system model also, to me, seeks to provide a scientific uh, explanatory model. In other words, it uses the science of cybernetics and the laws of cybernetics uh, to explain what's going on at the surface of organizations. So if some particular cybernetic laws are, um, are broken at, at, at the deep organizational level, then you will have pathologies emerging uh, at, the, uh, at the behavioral level, structural level in the organization, which you'll be able to explain uh, in terms of the, uh, the viable system model, the scientific model operating at the deeper level. Now, uh, the links between uh, positivism and, um, and the VSM, uh, there, are, there are a few. Uh, Marcus can talk, to, talk, talk for himself, but I, I do see him and certain other people associated, I guess, with the St. Gallen approach, uh, who, who are seeking to uh, measure the success of the viable system model uh, in fairly traditional terms about its in terms of its capability of improving organizational performance that leans a bit to me towards positivism uh, beer of course had his other measures to uh, judge organizational performance such as um, uh, well, uh, potentiality actuality and performance themselves as sort of broader measures uh, 
And there is a case to be made for complementing what the viable system model does uh, with positivistic analysis, empiricism. And that's been well, been well made by actor Bergen Vreens, who say it's not about time uh, we started to discuss what kind of structures best enabled us to create the kind of success, create the kind of organization uh, which has the capacity to be uh, effective and uh, viable and, uh, and effective. So uh, a lot of emphasis on the organization in the viable system model. Perhaps we should sort of think about what actual existing surface structures best enable that organization to flourish. And actor Berg and Vreens make, make that case, as well as making the case that uh, we may have to look to the social sciences for some of those, um, uh, for the answers to, to that kind of question. So it, interpretivism, how does the, uh, the viable system model uh, respond to interpretivism? Is it a good support for interpretivism? If we look at it from an interpretive point of view, uh, can we get the most out of it? Uh, better for me perhaps to explain this in terms of uh, second order cybernetics with which most people on this call of course are, are familiar with. Second order cybernetics is uh, well first mentioned by Margaret Mead Me, but inspired by von Forster uh, is a shift from concentrating on observed systems to, to looking at concentrating on ob observing uh, systems. Uh, and that, that kind of approach at the Biological Computer Laboratory um, enabled a lot of different thinkers to come together in developing a sophisticated form of second order cybernetics. So you've got uh, the work of uh, Maturana and Varela, of course, and uh, uh, Pask was a visitor, Ashby was, Ashby was there. Uh, and, and particularly from, uh, I guess, from Maturana and Varela, the, 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 the biological evidence, the neurophysiological evidence that, that we don't have access to an external reality. Not a new idea in philosophy or perhaps in sociology, but, but here's evidential empirical proof. We don't have access to external reality. Uh, and in their uh, phenomenal thinking, uh, cognition brings forth uh, a, wor a world. Um, and moving from that language facilitates the emergence of a consensual uh, domain. And again, I think this is Maturana, uh, everything said is, is said by an ob observer. And of course, once, once you concentrate on observing systems and, uh, uh, and the way that we observe the world and the way we talk about the world, then uh, you, you have to take responsibility uh, for your words and deeds. There's no objective reality to fall back on to justify uh, what, what, what you do. There's no access to some sort of external reality, even if there was one. Uh, cognition brings forth a world. What sort of world do we want to bring forth? We have responsibility for our words and deeds. Uh, and, and I guess the, um, uh, the way that this is, was expressed with the, the viable system model um, was to, is to see it as a, as a hermeneutic enabler. Uh, now, this idea of the vi viable system model as a, as a hermeneutic enabler within the interpretivist, I guess, second order cybernetic tradition, um, I think I first found in an article by Harnden, although Raoul would know because he was writing with Harnden at that time, and there's, a, there's certainly a, an article with, um, with Roger Harnden and, and Raoul which um, uh, talks about the VSM as a hermeneutic enabler at the same time as the, uh, the Handen article. Uh, and if you see the, the VSM as a hermeneutic enabler, uh, then uh, it's, uh, it, it's perceived as an aid to ongoing conversations uh, rather than an expression of scientific laws. And uh, here's a phrase that's used, I'm not quite sure in which article, it might be the, the, the one by um, Handen and Raoul. It, it acts as a kind of umbrella of intersection of different perspectives. Uh, and if it does that, then of course it can coordinate uh, interaction, co coordinate conversations and interactions uh, moving, uh, moving forward in developing and, and changing uh, systems, organi organizations. Um, 
Now, I, I, I see the, um, uh, the main advocates of that. And I will, I'll go on next to look at the methodological implications of this because that they are uh, the main development here has been methodological through Raoul's uh, Viplan um, methodology and um, Angela's and, and John's methodology for self-transformation. But let me put to you some difficulties with this position. Um, first of all, uh, if you read Beer, he, he, he claims um, that the, vi the viable system model derives from many years of scientific investigation. Uh, his best accounts of this are, I think, in Decision and Control. Um, he seeks to provide a scientific model, uh, and he discusses that in Popperian terms. It has to be a model which stands up to uh, falsification. Uh, and Beer himself says that, in, in, his ter in his view, it's never been falsified. Uh, and that's a view which um, Patrick Hoverstadt uh, repeats as well that it's never been falsified. And I think there are one or two people who've worked with Marcus who say it's never been falsified. And uh, a particularly interesting debate was that between uh, Werner Ulrich and, and, and Stafford Beer about the work in, uh, in Chile. Uh, and, and Beer came up with a, with a phrase which to me is, is important here. He, he says that well, I guess he's saying that the laws of, he's saying a viable system model isn't, it doesn't come from observers. The laws of viability don't come from observers. He insists that the viable systems have set up the laws of viability themselves. They set up the laws of viability themselves. They're scientific. Uh, they're, they're scientific things. So, uh, Maturana, where is everything said? It's said by an observer. The, the viable system model it, it, it is itself sets up the laws of viability. Uh, and I would argue that if you uh, if you go down the line, fully embrace the interpretive way of thinking about the viable system model uh, and using the viable system model as an aid to ongoing conversation then the model loses uh, what I regard as much of its importance uh, and its significance. Because if you're going to take second order cybernetics seriously, uh, then it can only provide one arena of conversation. Uh, and uh, within, the, within the way of thinking of second order, order cybernetics, uh, there'll be lots of other arenas of conversation which you cannot judge whether they are more valuable or less valuable than the one that the viable system model helps you to articulate. So, for example, you might have a discussion using the concepts and ideas of scientific management. You might have a discussion using the ideas of socio-technical thinking, systems thinking, or soft systems thinking, or uh, common sense. Uh, what's the justification for, within this way of thinking, for regarding the viable system model as providing you with a particularly good uh, way of, uh, of, of guiding conversations, allowing conversations to take, to take, to take place? Uh, and a lot of people who talk about um, combining the viable system model with, for example, soft systems methodology. Well, if it's grant soft systems methodology, it's interpretivist uh, background. Um, we'll put the viable system model at stage four there as, a mo mo as another model, along with lots of other conceptual models, which can be put on the table for debate. Uh, and it has no more basis, uh, no more reason for being regarded as a good conceptual model to debate than any of the others which are there on the table for debate. And to me, that's uh, taking away a lot of the force and the significance and the importance that the viable system model has. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that that is um, what um, Raul and Angela do, and I'll come on to that, their methodological approaches in a minute. But it may be an opportunity to stop there, uh, Angela, to allow some 
conversation just about these first two general points. Yes, we have uh, four people wanting to to um, making comments. One is uh, Bernard Scott. Would you like to comment, Bernard? Uh, I guess I'll put my video. Yes, thanks, Mike. Uh, just um, disagreeing with you about how you're characterizing second order cybernetics. Uh, it's not a kind of a pure constructivism. Uh, it, in my view, anyway, and I think most people who work in second order cybernetics regard second and first order cybernetics as complementary. I mean, if you are aware of yourself as an observer, you distinguish systems, which are the observed systems. And when you get into conversation with other observers, you, you come to, hopefully, you come to agreement about what it is that you're observing and you use your various logical arguments to distinguish it. In other words, you do science. I mean, there's nothing, nothing wrong, nothing wrong. You're just, as a second order subject, you're just aware, more aware of what it is that you're doing. But you're still doing something which is scientific. So this idea of the VSM as a hermeneutic enabler uh, is a bit, to me, a bit too loose. Uh, the VSM is a very well characterized model uh, and there are systems to which it, it can be applied and observers can come together and, and discuss the appropriateness, appropriateness of their, their modeling and their, their interpretations. So it's, to me, it's science. It's not, some, it's not just hermeneutics. I'll stop there, that's enough. <laughs> it's, a, it's a broad debate, which I think is probably one best left um, to, towards the end when, when I, I've covered. Um... Yes, okay. Uh, Raul, would you like to comment on this? Uh, let me say, I, I think that this distinction between first and second order cybernetics in relation to, to the VSM is something that uh, doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, and in fact, this is something that I discussed with Stafford uh, at length. And he, he, he was quite, quite clear that uh, to say that he was positivist or whatever it was a nonsense because he was looking at what has come now, constructivism. He was concerned with all the process of understanding a situation from the language perspective of the model. And in that sense, I think it's better to leave uh, Mike to develop his argument further uh, before we come to the point of saying, how, what is he having by making this distinction? Thank you, Raul. We uh, also have a related question, Ivo. Yeah, just a, that's a short one. Um, Mike, do you make a distinction between interpretivism and constructivism? And I am aware that it's a dangerous question. It can bring an hour of this discussion. That just a short <laughs> answer would suffice. Um, it, there is, there clearly are this. Well, interpretivism is the broader term. Constructivism is is is, is a form of philosophy which, in in my terms, fits within an interpretive perspective. I'll leave it at that. Right. So. Um... I think that we can carry on and then uh, we'll, we'll bring uh, more, more comments, okay? Angela? Okay. Angela? Do you want to do yours now, okay? Can I, I mean? Can I speak? Yes, please, please. So, um, my name's John Lee. I'm the author of the Reader's Guide for Platform for Change in the second edition, which is 25 years old. And about 25 years ago, I read Espeo and Harnden. And Mike Jackson's article at the end, I read Herndon and Espeo four times. I read this article about 10 times. And the thing that upsets me is Werner Ulrich claims to understand the viable system model. And I believe he does not understand the viable system model. Every system has a 531 and they recognize it. Most systems do not recognize their 24. Anybody who understands BSM understands what I just said. 
The main thing it is, is a communication tool between people within an organization to talk about common problems. The reality is that the BSM is inherently radical. The people that quote Werner Ulrich, call him a fat, call Stafford a fascist, they don't understand BSM at all. BSM inherently encourages autonomy. It inherently encourages mutual support. It humiliates dictators. It inherently sets up new information systems that bring you into the new time period, whatever it is. The best example Stafford uses was your child. Every time you talk to your child, it's a new experience for the child and you better figure it out or you're living in the old world. VSM brings you back in the new world. Every time you talk to a coworker, you are improving the organization by having a conversation within VSM. Thank you, Mike. Thank, thank you, John. I'm, I'm, what I did was put up a quote from uh, Stafford Beer, which um, was against Ulrich's art. Anyway, everyone can read the Ulrich um, Stafford Beer debate in which, as John says, Stafford says that he misunderstands uh, what Stafford was trying to do in Chile, and I wouldn't disagree with that. Mike, one, one final comment here from Jonathan. Uh, yeah, I uh, hope you can hear me all right. Um, yeah, um, using Popper to define what is scientific, there's a lot of work going on, uh, particularly by Massimo uh, Pigliucci, I hope I said that right, right which casts out, um, it examines the demarcation problem of what is scientific and what's not. And, and it's much more complicated, I think, that. and um, the defining lines in his, his work means um, things that we define as scientific can, can easily be defined as not scientific. Yeah. So I think that whole argument, I, I would have um, some doubts if you go um, and read Bigliucci in separating um, it as scientific or non-scientific. Well, Pop, Popper was the first person, as far as I'm aware, to address the sort of demarcation problem at any great length and to call it the demarcation problem. And uh, I, I mentioned that because Stafford Beer mentions Popper um, and, and so do others. And Stafford says that he wants the model to be false, to be, to be a scientific model. Uh, and in terms of his understanding of the philosophy of science, that means it must stand up to the criteria of falsifiability. Um, that, that's what he says. Now, I don't agree with Popper's definition of science, um, uh, but, but that's where we are. Okay. Angela? You're muted, Angela. Shall I continue? Sorry, just to say Martin Pivner is sharing with all of us uh, the, the the paper of the respond to Ulrich to G George and Ulrich critique to, to, to Beer. If right. Anybody wants to, to know that paper. So that's it, yes, please, please Mike, continue. Yeah. Okay, this is the most dangerous slide um, because it's about the, the, the methodological issues. And, and th those who have done most to um, develop the viable system model um, le lean to uh, an interpretive or second order cybernetics um, view, of, uh, view of it, I think. That's, that's the way they talk. Uh, uh, and I, I think that that comes about partly uh, because it, it eases implementation, uh, if you like. The, the model can appear uh, scientific, uh, rational, even intimidating to the people that you want to take it seriously and to change their organizations on the basis of the viable system model. So. If, if you see it as the basis for a conversation rather than the application of scientific laws, uh, then uh, you can engage in, in, in the conversations and, and that, of course, if you take people along with you, uh, eases implementation. So I think that that was certainly one of the, the, the reasons for uh, shifting in, into the interpretive direction. Uh, but, I, but I think that that can lead to problems and inconsistencies. 
uh, and, and let me try and illustrate. Uh, Raoul's methodology is the vibe plan uh, methodology. Stafford, of course, started on the basis that uh, you needed uh, that systems, boundaries, uh, purposes were observer dependent. <laughs> and, and he said that before you start any scientific work, then you, you need to develop a convention uh, about the system you're dealing with, uh, its boundaries, and, and its purpose purposes. And um, that's what, uh, I mean, Raoul's VI plan, it, it, uh, part of it is, is concerned with that. It, it, it's about, and he uses um, uh, Tascoy to uh, seek to deal with the issue of the identity. Uh, and the, I'm aware of the sort of cybernetic loops and the, the learning loop within, within ViPlan. Uh, the point that I want to make is that to me, the, there are two ways of being a, a hermeneutic enabler, if you like, uh, using the viable system model. And, and these weren't distinguished um, in the early paper by Hahn, and I don't think the one by Raoul and, and, and Hahn either. I think Raoul's way in which the VSM can be a hermeneutic enabler is that it establishes the structural arrangements, meta system, system ones, etc., for good conversations, proper discussions, appropriate discourse, and potentially effective solutions. In other words, we're concentrating on what must the structures be like in order that we can have the right conversations in the different parts of the viable system model, the different functional elements of the viable system model, enable in order to have conversations which lead us to uh, good understandings and good uh, solutions. Now, I want to point out to attention here that I see in this approach which is on the one hand, it's aiding a conversation. And on the other hand, we have the phrases there that they've underlined, which is good or right conversations, proper discussions, appropriate discourse, effective solutions. These all point back to the model having some kind of validity beyond which it actually might have as one way of aiding a conversation. Somehow it's coming across as the way of structuring arrangements so that we can have good, proper, appropriate conversations and effective solutions. It's got something about it, which is scientific, which is beyond uh, what one would normally understand as being a second order cybernetic bringing forth of a reality. Uh, the second way of being a, a hermeneutic enabler is uh, the methodology to support self-transformation, uh, which um, Angela and John uh, have demonstrated and given us some, quite a lot of good examples of how they've used it in, in that way. Uh, and again, there's Clearly, the viable system model talks about in Beer's original work. The viable system model talks about establishing a convention, uh, but it doesn't describe how to do that. Uh, and Angela and John are quite happy to use uh, rich pictures and um, uh, uh, rich, uh, rich, rich pictures from the soft systems methodology and aspects of soft systems methodology to achieve agreement, to achieve this kind of convention that's required to gain, gain an identity for the uh, organization. Of course, those conversations using those approaches can continue. And then within the methodology to support self-transformation, the VSM, the language of the VSM and the concepts, we're not talking about the structural arrangements providing the v, behind the VSM, providing the basis for the conversations here, we're talking about the concepts and the ideas uh, guiding a collective learning process. And that collective learning process focuses on key barriers to viability, on developing required organizational 
arrangements. And the tension I'm pointing to here is why under any kind of conversational methodology, interpretive methodology, second order cybernetic methodology, would there be any key barriers, required organizational arrangements? This is pointing to something that the viable system model can bring beyond simply being another element of a conversational process. Something scientific, if you like, which leads to it adding things which are good, proper, appropriate, key, required. There's the tension in those two approaches for me. Um, and I think if you look at it that way, it helps with some recent debates in, uh, that I've been reading. Uh, there was one, there's a debate in the European Journal of Operations Research about whether the viable system model was a problem, problem structuring method. Uh, and um, I think Duncan Shaw was one of the people involved in, in that particular debate. Uh, and he interpreted the viable system model as bringing a scientific model to the table. And of course, once you do that, uh, it can't really be a problem structuring method. Uh, and uh, Harwood argued back uh, in this, uh, using the, um, this notion of uh, the viable system model as a hermeneutic enabler, uh, that in fact it was a problem structuring method. And so again, you get a somewhat a tension between people observers of the viable system model uh, between it has, whether it has anything scientific about it, which clearly would close down conversation, or whether it is just a conversational uh, aid. And I think if it's just a conversational aid, it uses, so we'll go back to the point, it uses some of its significance and importance. Then there was a paper in, it's either in or it will be in the European Journal of Operations Research um, by I, I know one of the uh, sinners is here. Um, <laughs> Angela, I can't remember. Uh, uh, Mike Yearworth was another one uh, about constitutive rules for the viable system model. Uh, I'm not sure actually whether you can provide constitutive rules unless, it, unless you specify whether you're using the VSM in a positivistic, an interpretivistic, or a um, structuralist mode. And I think that's where some of the problems with that paper arise. And the constitutive rules that emerge for me, and I could give you quotations, uh, are very much along the lines of the viable system model providing a scientific model. Sorry, but that's what it says. Then we get the, um, a recent article, they may all be students of Angela's, uh, Cardoza, uh, Padilla, uh, and another, that appeared in a journal systems and that looked at it said it, it it seeks to integrate the viable system model and soft systems methodology um it doesn't succeed in doing so uh, i've not come across any article that successfully integrates them uh, you can use one as part of the other uh, or you can use them alongside one another but you can't integrate them because they rest upon, I think, I will argue, different paradigms. So you can certainly, um, if you like, you, you can use the VSM in a, in, in a way which doesn't do it justice as part of SSM as we've described uh, by just making it one of the conceptual models to debate at stage four. Uh, what the authors of that particular paper do is to distort SSM to make it part of the viable system model. Um, so for example, SSM is used to um, look at model, what kind of changes uh, might, might be needed to, to make happen the changes that have already been decided using the VSM as a diagnostic tool. And they actually give the game away right at the beginning um, uh, of, of the article, can't actually find it, but they talk about integrating the two approaches to achieve systemic viability. 
Well, of course, Czechland was never interested in systemic viability. So you have uh, the SSM there distorted as part of the VSM. So I'm pointing, I think, to a whole variety of tensions that exist in the way that we interpret the VSM. And it's useful to have the discussion uh, about them. Uh, I will go on to give my own view of uh, how the VSM can benefit from a structuralist interpretation and argue that a structuralist interpretation gets the most out of it uh, and does it most justice. But I better hold to that point to allow discussion on these points, Angela. Thank you, Mike. Um, Raul, would you like to start? Uh, yes, I think so. I think, it, Mike, it is sad that you do all these exercises or my plan and all of that without making a good uh, discussion of the requisite variety aspects that are related to these. Uh, I can uh, discuss good cybernetics. I can say that something that uh, balances varieties according to variety engineering, not just matching one side with the other side, but variety, uh, variety engineering is a far more complex uh, thing than just uh, matching varieties. And once you get into that, you, you start to go into aspects of what is good cybernetics. And in fact, what I am particularly interested in is to uh, support participants, the right participants in the discussions rather than just to have conversations. So one of the things that I am constantly asking uh, people is to work out uh, according to the purposes that uh, they ascribe to the situation, who are the right participants. And that is something that the rival system model helps us to, 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 to see. And, uh, that has nothing to do with good or right conversations, proper discussion. In fact, the, to, to discuss right plan, you need to have a far more interest in conversation about what is uh, uh, the, the use of that method and methodology, as you well know, uh, to use that methodology beyond the simple uh, application of the model. So uh, I suspect that uh, in order to discuss my plan, you need to have far more interesting conversations than the ones that you have put there. Well, I thought I'd emphasize the conversational elements, but it, it, in a sense, some, some of the language you were using there, Al, points to the tension that I was seeking to bring forward. Uh, things, the communication things, you didn't emphasize the problems of variety engineering, you just gave something very general term. Well, you, you said, who is the right part, who are the right participants and the viable system model can guide you to that. That's so you clearly think that the viable system model has some kind of, I don't know, objective way of deciding who the right participants are to take part in those conversations. There is no objectivity there. This is an agreement in the discussions. What is the purpose of the organization that you are looking at? And that is part of a discussion of purpose and not, is not objectively stated. And once you get some agreement about that, is that you start to talk about who are the right participants, for instance, to work out uh, the, 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 the relevant the policies for the, the organization, who are the right people to talk about the external environment and to talk about the internal cohesion of the organization. So that's something that only happens once you have had a proper discussion of purposes. And that's not uh, objectifying the system at all. Well, I, I, um, from my point of view, you're, you, you are simply reinforcing my argument, Well, that in fact the viable system model is entering in there, uh, even if it's after the discussions and then in guiding the discussions, 
uh, in a way which is beyond what you would not. If it isn't doing, what's the point of the viable system model? Why, do, why don't we just have a, a general discussion based upon common sense or one based because upon... Because clearly I don't know who are the right participants in a conversation unless... So the viable I system model that. tells you who are the right participants. I, I'm telling you that it, <laughs> the problem is that unless you have had a good discussion about purposes, and then you, 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 you work out who are the, the, which are the directions that you want to the, uh, have for the organization, then you can start talking about uh, participants and not before. Um, we we have uh, an, I, would, I don't know if Mike wants to react to this. To to what, um, Angela? No, no, I don't want to interrupt the conversation. If you were going to continue talking. Well, no, because um, I either haven't made my case. All I see is Val demonstrating the point that I've made, so I can't say any more. So can you be more explicit? What is the point that I, uh, that you made that I have? Uh, well, I, I accept completely that um, the Vipan methodology starts with uh, means of developing this convention around systems boundaries. And, that, and that's a conversational thing where you arrive at, uh, at purposes. And once you've arrived at purposes, then um, you bring in the viable system model as a means of telling you uh, who are the right people to have the right conversations, the proper discussions, the sort of appropriate discourse to lead to effective solutions. You're using the viable system model as a scientific tool to guide the conversations which take place. You, you, you still don't pay attention to the idea of relationships. You don't pay attention to the idea of relationships and you don't pay attention to the fact that once you work out what is the meaning of the system of the organization that you are dealing with, then you have to, to discuss what kind of relationships are necessary to support, to support the development of that particular... But why do, I need, why do I need the viable system model to do that? Because without the viable system model, you cannot recognize who are the stakeholders who are relevant for the situation that you are dealing with. You don't know who are the people in the external world that are uh, affecting the purposes that you are dealing with. You don't know who are the participants within the organization to uh, support the cohesion of the organization and together with the, the ones who are dealing with external. But, <laughs> if, but if, I had a scientific, if I had a scientific management model, for example, I'd know all those things. If you I don't did. Know. How, how do you know? Tell me, how do you know who are the right participants? Because I'd stick them in a hierarchy. I'd look at, I'd give them roles to, 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 to partake of, and, and I'd make sure they only communicated with their superiors and the people below them. That would be a model which would allow me to, to set up the conversations within the logic of a scientific management approach. You know, I, I, I can tell you that you, there is nothing that in, in there that can be said in the, with the, without the support of the uh, tools that I have I have uh, mentioned, the tools of variety engineering, the tools of relationships, the tools of uh, conversations for purpose uh, definition. Or I mean, without all these things, forward, a better way of you it. can say who are the right people to participate in a, in, 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 a, in a situation. You're putting forward a better way of doing it, and that must be based upon something. Is it that the model is more scientific? Uh, it, it is that the model is discussing the problems of relationships between the complexity <laughs> of different participants in the situation. And in your terms, that makes it more scientific. It does, it's your words. You're putting the words, it's more scientific. I'm not saying it's more scientific. I'm saying it makes it, the cybernetics of the situation for me is better if the balance uh, of varieties and relationships is adequate. But well, you're going around in a circle because, of course, the cybernetics is because it's a cybernetic model. The, the, the cybernetic model there is strictly to help understanding <clears throat> how is it that 
different view, uh, viewpoints can come in and uh, support the, the, the debates within the organization and go from the stakeholders to the, the, the policy makers in a whole network of relationships that uh, requires to understand the Viplan methodology in full, and that you haven't actually explained. Um, I don't know if you want to listen. There is a few people who want to have been waiting to participate. Shall we give them the opportunity? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think we could probably have five more minutes on this before I, I progress, um, Angela. Yeah. Okay, so Wolfgang. I wanted to just a minor issue, a question. Uh, don't we have both dimensions? So the conversational and the positivist aspect captured in, in the VSM itself. If I look, for instance, in on the relations between systems functions or systems systems one and, 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 and the environment, the, 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 the errors or channels are both information communication channels, but also channels to exchange variety. And which means at the bottom level, it's concrete variety. I mean, if we're talking about operations, about yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that. If we, uh, if we look at the BSM, we have both dimensions in it. It's a conversational system, an information system, but it's also an exchange of varieties, if it, which can go to tangible things. So it's both there, actually, in my view. In Jose, well, sorry, Mike, you want to react to this, or shall we? No, because I think it's a point that I take up in, in, in later. But thanks, I do take that point from Wolfgang. So, Jose? Yeah, in, in my observation is, is in relation the, to this um, a difficulty, as Mike is um, saying, of combining a subsystem methodology with a, a VSM. And uh, you uh, take Viplan as an example of uh, a kind of application uh, of this interpretative or interpretive um, approach. Uh, I think that the, the discussion that you have with, uh, with Raul uh, about the um, adequacy of, uh, of using it, uh, I think that comes because you get too far away in the process of uh, applying the Bible system model. Uh, uh, I see uh, that the, the issue comes before you start to apply it, and before you start to Considering the application of the viable system model, you have people, you have uh, problem situations, and you have to decide who is going to intervene, the stakeholders, who, who is going to intervene in uh, studying the problem and uh, deciding which approach are they going to use to uh, face the problem. This part is the first step of applying the viable system model that comes before you define the identity or the purpose of the organization for defining this purpose before starting to apply the VSM and to create a structure, start to make the, the, the deep analysis of variety that Raul is, is uh, commenting. Be much before that, you have to decide the identity of the organization, establish the boundaries of the organization, what is inside, what is outside, who are the, the the persons outside and persons and in other institutions in, in organization outside and uh, what is the people that we are going to consider inside? Once that all that is more or less clarified, uh, these these people will study the problem somehow with some help, and this is uh, this part of the process of uh, applying the VSM is where I see that may be useful by plan and so system methodology, that's to help those people to clarify what the purpose of the organization is and what is the identity of the organization. What is the, what is, what is the organization and what is what it is not the organization. And the, this clarification is where I, I see that the subsystem methodology, I see it useful. Of course, it's a different methodology than the ABSM. Yes, it's clear. When we talk about using them, it's not a question of combining them, making an integrated, it's just using a, a, a tool that we think that may be useful for that first step of applying the uh, viable system uh, methodology. 
this is how I see it. So if we if we if put emphasis on this side, I don't see the conflict uh, or, the, or the or the difficulty that you are uh, facing with the by plan, etc. <clears throat> yeah, that, that that helps some clarification. I think the, <laughs> I mean, beer was clear that you needed this convention, and what uh, I think, um, and that the VSM itself doesn't provide the means for doing that. Although, I mean, it would help uh, if, if you articulated different structural arrangements on the basis of different identities, it could help with that. Um, so um, uh, Raul uh, and uh, Angela and John see the value of uh, rich pictures, for, for example, as a way of, uh, of reaching an, an identity for the organization before they go into the what you described as the deep, um, the deep modeling. Uh, the problem is, of course, that, that Checkland, for example, wouldn't continue with deep modeling. He, he, he would continue to put up lots of different relevant systems and conceptual models. Bible system might be one. Uh, and he would have conversations around uh, feasible and desirable change. Uh, Angela. On the basis I, of um, those particular conceptual models. Out. Michael, let me just make a comment. Uh, first of all, I don't see right plan as integrating VSM with SSM. No. SSM is a, a very valuable methodological tool and it can help for debates and discussions about purpose. But identity is different to that. Identity in the way that uh, I use it is based on the relationships that different parts of the or stakeholders get into so that together the quality of these relationships that include values, include all kinds of aspects. How can these re relationships actually support uh, the formation of the identity of the organization? So uh, one thing that if you go to my book, uh, 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 Managing Complexity, Organizational Systems, you will find that there is plenty there about uh, this problem of uh, working out relationships and from there uh, going into following the ideas of uh, requisite variety and variety engineering that I just mentioned before, you can start to work out uh, an identity that uh, uh, helps to pursue the interests of the members of that, of that particular uh, situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, no attempt to, to connect to SSM to, to VSM. The only thing that I think is very valuable of SSM is that it helps to discuss purposes. I'm I think I'm going to have to agree with you, Al, yeah. in, 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 every, in every aspect of that. Well, the, we should have from the beginning. That but the, que the, the, question, the question I'm asking is that why then do VSM advocates go on to this deep analysis using the viable system model when Declan devotees would go on to uh, have their conversations using a full range of um, root definitions and conceptual models. But in that, to enable me to, to finish um, uh, and to have some discussion time at the end, I, I want to progress now, uh, Angela, if that's okay. Yeah, well, we have um, three more people, including myself, that would like to react, but we can all wait, I think. And this okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to make you happy by the end. Right, so in the 1992 paper, uh, I advocated looking at the viable system model as a kind of structuralist, um, a, a aligning it with structuralism, because I think that gets the most out of the model uh, and explains best what the model is seeking uh, to do. Um, and here's some reasons for that. I, I still adhere to that partially, but I've been influenced since by Pickering's book, The Cybernetic uh, Brain, to have what I think is a more sophisticated argument uh, around this. So uh, Stafford B was convinced uh, in, 
as he writes about it, the, the viral system is a scientific model uh, expressing objective laws. Uh, and once the convention has been agreed, he calls it a convention in decision and control, I think decision, it might be hard to enterprise. Once the convention has been agreed uh, in the way that you might use SSM for, uh, he says uh, there's lots that can be scientifically said about systems. Those are his words. And of course, he talks about the science of effective organization. And he talks about Ashby's law of requisite variety being, in management terms, similar to Newton's laws of in physics. And he's furious with administrators uh, because they contend there exists, this is him quoted again, they contend there exists and can exist no science competent to discover those laws of effective organization. Right, so let's get into the meat of that argument. Here's what I take structuralism to be. And I'll outline, first of all, my understand that what I put forward in the 1992 argument paper. I took structuralism to be an, an intellectual movement. I, I've taken this definition off Wikipedia. Uh, it's an intellectual movement to, to analyze and explain invariant structures, the constitutive, the in and constitutive of nature, society, and the human uh, psyche. I think you can see the connections there with, with, with what Stafford Beer was trying to do. Uh, and I also pointed to two further things in that 1992 uh, paper, uh, and that there were historical links between structuralism and, and cybernetics. For example, um, Levi Strauss, perhaps the, the exemplar of French structuralism, uh, regards Wiener as a major contribution, contributed to structuralism. Uh, Piaget uh, regards Wiener as a major contributor towards structuralism. So bo both those structuralist gods, if you like, saw cybernetics as a contribution to, to structuralism. And again, Stafford Beer in Decision and Control, I think the longest debate is about this, uh, says there's a, a, a need to uncover the mechanisms which underlie the facts. This puts him closely within the structuralist camp rather than the positivist camp. There are mechanisms which you can uncover using the science of cybernetics, which uh, underlie uh, the surface behavior, the, the facts that you might recognize from a, uh, uh, looking at the system. But I, but I was left not really knowing what kind of structuralism um, I, I thought the model was akin to, or best served, or structuralism best served the model. Uh, and it was Pickering's book that made me uh, perhaps make some progress in my own mind, at least, in, in getting close to uh, what I felt was a satisfactory answer to this. Uh, and what Pickering did for me was take me back into the history of what he calls British cybernetics, uh, and which, which I think he um, successfully distinguishes from first order and second order cybernetics. Although, of course, it's, it, it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's a tool. Uh, we, we know that people like uh, McCulloch was, uh, was part of first order cybernetics. He was influential on uh, Maturana and Varela. He was Beer's guru. So you, you, can't, you can't pigeonhole people. Uh, but it, but there are, it is worthwhile for an analytical purposes to distinguish first order, second order, the uh, British cybernetics. Uh, and what Pickering says about British cybernetics is that it has to it a performative uh, idiom and that knowledge, it's not objective knowledge where you look at the world and, uh, and you understand it, that knowledge emerges from the interaction between systems um, so, for example, you, could, you couldn't understand in advance what Ashby's homeostat was going to do. Uh, you had to put it in relationship to an environment, and then you learned something about 
the homo homeostats and indeed about the environment from that particular co-evolution of the two things. The same with Gordon Pask's learning systems. Um, in, in, the, in the book, I, I, I tried to illustrate this with, with, with Duolingo, because I was trying to learn Spanish um, when I had the place in Spain. And um, Duolingo was finding out that I had no chance of learning Spanish. Uh, and I was finding out how Duolingo was, was taking on board this horribly useless person trying to use another language, learn another language. But of course, it's the same in Pasch's um, fun palettes, whereby uh, people's appreciation of, of art and architecture and what they can achieve um, leads, co-evolves with the building itself, the architecture of the building. And when the architecture of the building changes, then the way that people interact with it alters again. It's co-evolution. The same with uh, Walter's flicker, um, the feedback mechanism exhibited by Pink Floyd, for example, where you get um, light shows on the basis of the music, but the light show in it in the in drives on the um, that drives on the, the musicians to do something different as well. It's a dance of agency in Pickering's words. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a revealing approach. It's not in framing. Those terms are from Heidegger. Uh, we, we don't have a, a concept of, uh, of objective knowledge, the real. It, the world reveals itself, the capacity, the potential of the world and the system reveals itself to us. Um, it's a kind of pragmatism, really. Um, Pickering accepts that, but he thinks there are differences. But I, I, that, to me, uh, helped me to understand much more what the viable system model um, was, was, was about. And my fault, perhaps, for not understanding this before. But it was this history uh, of the, that, of course, Stafford took advantage of uh, and developed from uh, Ashby and with Pask and, and others. Uh, which, which had a huge impact on the nature of the viable system model. So uh, what you have with the viable system model is, is, is similarly a process of revealing, whereby an organisation set up according to the viable system model is capable of co-evolving with its environment and learning from its environment, learning about its environment, and what it can achieve within that environment, changing itself and changing the environment at the same time, developing the potential of both, the dance of agency uh, with the environment. Now, how do I square that with structuralism? Well, it seems to me is that what the viable system model embodies are, are they are laws, uh, but they're different forms of laws. They're, they're laws that enable adaptation, the laws that allow a system, what a system must be like to be performative, to engage and learn in relation to another system. Uh, Matran, Matran and Varela teasingly at one stage talk about the laws of conservation of adaptation. And I think this is something that could be developed in relationship to what the VSM um, uh, is about. And the phrase of Pickering's, which does the job for me at the moment, is to see it as an ontology of becoming within a fixed framework. In other words, there is, in a sense, a fixed framework, the scientific laws of variety and feedback and black box underpinning uh, the viable system model, which enable systems to be uh, adaptive and to change, to become, to engage in a dance of agency, to be revealing of themselves and their potential and that of their environment. And that's taken up by um, Brian Eno with his generative music, where you do set the thing off according to certain rules, uh, which might be analogy the rules of the viable system model, but then the thing gains a life of its own uh, and develops in ways which you couldn't of an anticipated in advance in relationship to its environment. And he, he also uses 
other people do, but I think it's in Eno, Eno's discussion of, of, of Beer's book, the gardener metaphor. Well, you do everything you can to with the soil and, and the location of your plants, um, water them when necessary to create the garden that you want. Uh, and those are the kinds of laws embedded in the uh, viable system. Well, but you're never sure what you're going to get, uh, how the garden is going to turn out uh, at the end as it interacts with all these various environmental factors. So my conclusion is that the, uh, the best way of seeing the viable system model is in relation to this kind of pragmatic structuralism. And I accept there's more work to be done in what that exactly uh, means, because you could regard those two philosophies as in ways, in some ways in, as opposed. As, as opposed, but it's this framework which enables adaptation to take place, this ontology of, of becoming to actually occur. So if you want a conclusion, I'd say this. I think uh, as a systems person, more than a cybernetician, nevertheless, that the viable system model is one of the very few scientific models that is actually applicable to social systems and that it does embody laws governing the viability and effectiveness of complex systems in turbulent environments, with structuralist in those terms, and that it can contribute to enhance the steering capacities of organizations and societies. My God, we need that at the moment in thinking about transformation post COVID or what some kind of post-capitalist society might be like. And we should start telling people and convincing decision makers that in fact it is a scientific model that embodies laws governing viability and effectiveness and that it can contribute to enhancing the steering capacities of organizations and societies. Let's not apologize about it. Let's insist upon it, that this is what it's capable of doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> well, people are apl applauding before we finish. <laughs> anyway, uh, there are several people who want to contribute. So I'll, I'll start with Alfredo that has been trying to say something for a while. And then I will. And then I have a list of other people that have been uh, in the chat making comments. Okay. So, Alfredo. Are you, you need to unmute. Oh, I have a question. May I? No, uh, well, we are. No, oh, no, we have people in the chat. Okay, good. So, but this is Bernard Scott. If, if no one's before me, I'd like to just make a comment to Mike about uh, the previous slide where you talk about structuralism and. Is this Bernard speaking? Bernard, yeah. yes. Yeah, hi, Bernard. Hello. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking at the other screen because it's bigger than the one where... So I'm not looking in the face. The, the previous slide, Mike, to your comment, that one. Um, I'm trying to keep this brief. Uh, structuralism is a very vague label over a, a number of disciplines, as I'm sure you're aware. And you, you cited um, uh, Levi, Levi Strauss for one, but you also have the linguistic chaps and so on. And you mentioned Piaget. Now, Piaget, as I mentioned in the chat, when he encountered cybernetics, he embraced it thoroughly. And I've, I've, I've put in a chat a quote of his, uh, which is um, telling. Uh, um, let me find it again. Uh, from 1977. Cybernetics is now the most polyvalent meeting place for physico-mathematical sciences, biological sciences, and human sciences. So um, he thoroughly appreciated that uh, as far as his own interests were in you know, the um, developmental epistemology, genetic epistemology, cybernetics was wonderful. And he has a little book on stru structuralism, but that is not relevant to this. All I'm saying is that uh, cybernetics, once it comes along, gives structuralism what it was missing, was, was some kind of conceptual coherence. So it, it's just philosophical vagary at that point, up to that point. There's nothing coherent there. 
And then we get um, Pickering, my other, so that's me dismissing structuralism. And then we get to Pickering, and I've got criticisms of Pickering, is that if you read his book, which I'm sure you did, he stops short of any serious discussion of second order cybernetics. He gives a, a very, I love the history, it's fascinating history, but he stops short of mentioning anything about past conversation theory, which past had developed by 1970, imminent all his work, it's just not there. And like all philosophers, Pickering adopts his own particular point of view, his own positions, and he, and he works it for all his work. He interprets it, everything in his book to fit his particular frame of, frame of reference to do this performative, this and performative, that, which he'd already used generally in science anyway. So it's just a, it's a distortion. Uh, it, it, it gives a, it gives a, it gives a and my, my stronger view of this actually is once you have second order cybernetics, and in particular conversation, conversation theory of Gordon Pass, you've got a sort of meta theoretical stance or in, in which philosophy is just seen to be another domain in which people are talking to each other. So sign, second order cybernetics is, you know, in a way does away with philosophy. We don't need philosophy as philosophy. It's history. It's historically interesting to look at it, but it's not a separate domain of discourse. We, the, the, you know, philosophy does not subsume cybernetics or second order cybernetics. Yeah, so, I mean, there's some really interesting points there, it's of course. A, it's um, a strong point, so I don't expect immediate agreement. No, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not actually going to agree or disagree. I'm just going to point out, point out why I think the points you've made are interesting. And, and this is a discussion now. And I hope that the talk I've given uh, opens these discussions. The, it's interesting that von Glattersfeld, of course, developed uh, his work on the back of Piaget. I think that's right, Bernard, isn't it? That was it significant. is very right. His, his, his influences are, or he was already influenced by cybernetics. And he, his core scientific core, because I consider Piaget to be a scientist, is Piaget. And he adds to that a couple of philosophers. Vico and Barclay, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he invents something called radical constructivism, which is argued very, co very neatly, elegantly by uh, Ralph Glanville in one of his papers. Essentially, is identical to second order cybernetics. And there's, there's a kind of an ongoing conversation between people like von Furster and von Beiserfeld, where they're all very courteous and, and polite to each other. But essentially, um, by constructing this radical constructivism concept, um, uh, von Glesensfeld muddies the waters. And it gets even further muddied when some German chap, Schmidt, I think, uh, develops a whole thesis about different forms of constru constructivism in German initially, which does not mention second order cybernetics. No. If uh, I could just, uh, be, just, yeah. just because there would be other people, just respond I just say what the other two points I found interesting there is that I mean Pickering clearly does have a view on second order cybernetics. He doesn't like it. He, he, he thinks it's a distraction that that's taken us away from the main interests of British cybernetics, which he saw as a different form of ontology. Well, yes. And uh, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, okay. And then the second thing is that um, second order cybernetics, if if you like, bring an end to philosophy. The set, exactly the same argument was made by the pragmatist. Uh, and I think there is um, something uh, uh, worthwhile looking, going back to pragmatism and looking at the relationship I, between I that. Agree there. I, I put C.S. Peirce as a proto edition. Yeah, okay, good. Um, I'd like to make a comment um, talking about pragmatism. I think that I come from a very pragmatic position because what have I fascinated me of the VSM always is um, the understanding that the social world and the physical world is extremely complex. And uh, the only way that we can try to learn about the complexity is by trying to, to, to have like snapshots of this complexity. And what I think that the BSM is uh, extremely useful is to be able to interpret the patterns of relationships that developed uh, emerge from the way that people relate in organizations. And, uh, and, and, uh, and it gives us a very, very powerful language to try to understand and create collective mental models 
about what's going on in the organization and therefore being able to, um, to, 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 to identify what could be done, how can we uh, improve these patterns of relationship to, to be more effective in, in, in a social group. So I think that uh, for me, the, what is fascinating is, is the practicalities of how you can use this to interpret and to map complexity in organizations. And how can you uh, create a, a shared language between people to try to, to, to join be able to, 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 to talk about this, this complexity. And I find more interesting the possibilities that it opens for understanding complexity, that the discussion in terms of uh, how can we interpret, I mean, the philosophical tradition that is, that, that is more or less useful to explain the original theory. And I'm a little bit with Bernard Scott in the sense that, I mean, cybernetics is such a complex Thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a science and it's an art. So I agree that, that there is a science that uh, Stafford developed when he um, worked on the, on, on the understanding of the neurological uh, uh, system of the human being and make this metaphor of, of how can this be interpreted in social organizations. But I think that is also an art in the sense that uh, in the putting that knowledge into practice in an organization uh, uh, implies uh, for you to 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 to, to co-evolve with your understanding and uh, the way that people begin to develop consciousness about what is it, how can we interpret and map together these patterns of interaction? So, just to well to to put my own uh, position, but um, there is other people also uh, that wanted to comment, and we are running out of time. So I would like um I don't know Howard. Silver, Silverman had a comment. I don't know if you're still around or you still want to make your comment. Or... I am here. Yes. Thank you, Angela. Um, Mike, uh, this has been a, a interesting. Thank you. It's, it's, uh, I've heard it as a somewhat context-free um, analysis. You didn't um, mention any distinctions about uh, VSM application in organizational versus social, broader social context. And I wonder if those types of distinctions are pertinent for how one might understand uh, the positivist versus interpretivist versus structural um, applications of, of VSM. Um. I, I suspect not, but I, I, I suspect the viable system model has has significance and importance for organizations and, and social systems made up of multi-organizations. Um, I, I do think that um, I mean, originally the work was, was more around org organizations than, um, and organizations have changed uh, over time with uh, since, since Stafford was writing, there's much more emphasis upon network organizations and um, outsourcing. And, uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm familiar. And so does do these distinctions have implications specifically for your analysis of how uh, is it more appropriate within an organization where we can have uh, reach agreement on boundaries and purpose and et cetera, more easily reach agreement um, to, in such situations, is it appropriate that um, a, a more positivist outlook on, on the application of VSM uh, 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 can be, can be used in a positive sense in conjunction with an interpretive and structuralist sense. Um, I, I think that the, there are there are, there are situations. Uh, if, if this is what you're getting at, Howard, uh, for, forgive me. I think you're making a very sophisticated point. And I'll just have a, a dab at it. I think there are circumstances where you could certainly uh, go in without necessarily worrying about the the need to convince people about implementation or lead them through a conversation. In, a, in other words, you could, you could conduct a straightforward viable system model diagnosis without having to um, worry about other aspects of what you were doing. 
um, and um, other circumstances where uh, I suppose it, you, if you're a believer in the model, you, you're trying to get it through a conversational process, get, get as much of it accepted as you, uh, uh, as you can, given the particular constraints in the situation and what, what people there believe. And that would be more the case in multi-organisations and on social issues, I guess, than it would with, um, uh, with hierarchical organisations, where you may be just making certain adjustments. Thank you, Mike. Um, Martin, would you like to comment? Yes, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, very well speech. Thank you very much, Mike. I enjoyed it a lot. I agree, uh, especially to your conclusions. And I was asking another question in the chat because uh, you say we need to be, um, uh, we need to convince decision makers and to, according to my experience, the problem in convincing decision makers lies exactly in the, in, in, in the question about what the viable system model actually is and is doing for them, not in the epistemological uh, sense, but in the just practical sense of, of why do I need it. And uh, I think uh, if, if you wanna start to distribute the viable system model, you have to get people interested in it in, and, and tell them why they really need it. And as you pose it, to, to pose it as uh, in an enhancing means of uh, enhancing the steering capacity of an organization. That's exactly the way that uh, we must position it, I believe, because in that sense, it's not competing with classical approaches. It's not competing with the organization charts. It's not competing with business process management and things like that but it's something else, it's something added to it. It's like you're not only um, watching at the anatomy of an organism and not only on the physiology, but also on the neurology of it, which is exactly the, the, the control of communication in the system, what it's actually doing. So I think uh, uh, that should also be a part of the question about what it, really, what it really is, the perspective from the people you want to convince. Thanks again. Yeah, I would I would uh, employ exactly that same kind of methodology in in going into an organisation or multi-organisation with the viable system model. Uh, nevertheless, I, I would believe that it had uh, certain structural laws which told me things of a scientific nature about um, uh, the way that viable and effective organisations need to be organised. So. Uh, it is a tension between it for me it's a tension between those 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 two things absolutely agree and i also agree that both messages are uh, equally important yes thank you martin um olaf olaf brookman are you still around yep yeah i'm here <clears throat> i'm here hi angela hello olaf Was there a question or what you wanted to say? I, I wonder if you wanted to share your comments on the chat. Ah, you know, I, uh, I shared a couple of insights. Uh, to me, as mainly a practitioner, it is, my well, EFISM is, is, is the most powerful uh, model that I, I, I know and use and practice. Um, I have an idea of why it's not always easily adopted by decision makers. And I think the tenet of one of my comments is that, that the VSM makes brutally transparent and very, very honest of where control issues and control problems come from. So it gives you a map of the organization, but it also puts yourself on the map. Um, and not every decision maker may be, may be um, willing to or able to face that. Um, but it works. Uh, yeah, for me, it's no, no question, obviously. Okay, thank you, Olaf. Um, we have also um, Mark, Mark Pearson. Would you, would you like to comment? Yeah, I, I would. Um, so I, I, I worked for 20 years um, in a company that in theory should have had the easiest job of doing this sort of thing. Uh, it was a 
on the surface, a principle-based Catholic healthcare system um, only in small communities where they were monopolies. And it really had no competitive threats whatsoever. <laughs> it could do anything it wanted. And in my community, I kind of got away with that. But um, here's my belief after all these years is that organizations, whether they be people or companies, when they are developing, they are structurally coupled to an environment that they don't even recognize, they can't recognize, they co-emerged with it. And as the environment changes, they are completely functionally, completely incapable of adapting. And it is a huge mistake to try to make children out of elders or try to make vibrant companies out of dying companies. And I think that the reason that I see really smart people keep doing this is because the elders have the money. <laughs> and I think that it's the drunk <clears throat> looking for the keys under the light post when he dropped it in the dark. I think if we don't uh, come to imagine that these beautiful scientific true discoveries of beer and Ashby uh, need to play out where there are enough degrees of freedom, meaning for me, meaning in neighborhoods where people, sort of the Eleanor Oskamas world, where people can actually talk to each other, we are, uh, we are wasting our time. And that's normally okay. In the 50s, I would say this is great. But in 2021, and I have young daughters, I think it's unethical. So if we don't have real conversations about who we should be working with, rather than working with anyone who'll listen to us or anyone who's paying our salary, I think uh, you know we need to talk with Mick Ashby and then find out whether we're being ethical or not. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mark. Um, we have I don't know if Vanilla wants to comment, but you will be doing comments in the chat, Vanilla. So sorry, I couldn't find the unmute. <laughs> um, and no, I've nothing to add except how much I'm enjoying this. You're all so interesting. And I thank you. <laughs> thank you, Anila. I don't know if Alfredo still wants to talk because he was trying to talk. Well, I mean, I wanted to come in with the last, with the debate between uh, Mike and Raoul. And I think the, the problem was just with one single word that Mike picked up, which I picked up as well, and the word was right. When Raoul said, get the right people to, after the debate, get the right people to to, to, to participate. And I, and I think it was just that word, and I think we, you get around that, but I think what Raoul meant was that he was emphasizing requisite variety, and once you'd established that requisite variety was needed somewhere in the company, then you could the, then the people would naturally by the company or by themselves be would come forward because if you if you, if you variety was between you and your supplier then obviously the toilet cleaner wouldn't be involved in that it would be the people who are making the stuff to the supply so I think that's what Raoul was meaning that that the naturally the the viable system by talking about general viable system things, the, the right people would emerge. I, th I think that, I just wanted to say that. O on the three topics, I don't think we can, I think you could blur them together a bit. Uh, I'm very much on the gardener side. I remember having a very amusing conversation with, with uh, Stafford, and he was trying to work out how to uh, tie a company's organization to a, a garden pond. And his, his view was the garden pond with the frogs and the lilies organized itself. And if we could someone connect that to the company, the company could learn from the pond. I don't know if the pond could learn from the company, but anyway, the company could learn from the pond. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I'm with your gardener metaphor. Now that, that's discussed, uh, Alfredo, in cybernetics and management and the, the attempt to... They couldn't, yeah, yeah, they couldn't get... They couldn't, he couldn't get the oh, pond interested okay. in what was happening in the factory. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I hope, I hope it's clear that 
I've got absolutely no problem with the way that Raoul or Angela and John use the viable system model. I just don't think it's got anything to do with interpretivism or second order cybernetics. Yeah, but I think it was the word right that jarred and it did jar with me as well. But um, but your fourth point, your last slide, the fourth point, uh, talk with people, is, is that where the, the hermeneutic enabler doesn't, that's not, surely that's where that comes in. I mean, the, VSM is an enabler for that talk to take place. It's it's a it's something you can you can build a talk around. So I mean I think that's where the two approaches could. Well, it is, but the question is why is it better than any other way of? Well, I, don't, uh, well, I mean I, I don't think we should necessarily have a, a like, discussion. I don't think it's a Eurovision contest. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think um, there's a lot of uh, lots of views around, and they've all got good points and bad points. I mean I. Uh, um, I don't want to insult Stafford's memory, but I don't think he, he's a god, and uh, just because he's, it's not the Ten Commandments. I mean, it is a very, very sensible and very intellectual and very great message, but it doesn't have to be the truth. Uh, that's all I want to say. <laughs> All right, thank you, Alfredo. And just the last few comments we have Seslak and then Jonathan, right? I'm, I'm torn between quantitative complexity and qualitative complexity studies and trying to make a um, to make understand Luhmann and Gelman. you know so this is my point you know and say how would you how would you what are your suggestions concerning the VSM and intersubjectivity this is my first question. And secondly, to what extent, what could be the arguments about the VSM in discussions with, say, Gelman is passed, has passed away, but for instance, this quantitative schools of complexity, because sometimes when I try to communicate them with sh in showing, being competent in mathematics, by the way, so they say, no, this is a kind of something that is interesting, is qualitative, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. So how to communicate with them using, for instance, the VSM and your com the concepts of subsystems, methodology, et cetera, et cetera. This is a very difficult question, but I'm facing it every time. Thank you. I'm not the person qualified to give you an answer to that, but I, I would agree with something that I think is in Angela and John's book, that we can't wait forever for these quantitative complexity theories to come up with a, uh, a methodology or an approach or a model which helps us to deal with complexity. We've already got something completely adequate in the viable system model, and it's about time that they recognise that that's the case as well. In, in terms of Lumen, I think the debate's very interesting. Lumen actually... Um, uh, of course, was well, in his early days equally equally influenced by Parsons and, and that system, social systems trend. Uh, later on, um, altering it from so looking at parts and holes, looking at systems and, in, and environments. So yeah, the, the, you you've got almost a similar sort of issues uh, around around that. So just inter interesting points, and I, I can't answer. Okay, thank you, thank you for this, thank you. Right, um, we have uh, Jonathan, yes? Mike, thank you very much, that was really interesting. Um, so one observation was what um, interested me was that you kept wanting to put it, uh, put all your conversation into the scientific paradigm. Um, and I'd go back to Estelle who said that science was good for the natural sciences, um, but if you wanted to talk about social structures, you need to talk about intentionality. And I found that um, you wanted to peg it to various philosophies, but without including uh, critical realism um, or inactivism, which have which I think you can bring into the VSM and move it forward from from where it was. So that uh, we keep wanting to tie it to a paradigm, but I think the VSM is is more than a philosophy. It's well, it, and less if you want to put it that way. It's very simply, it's a means of understanding complexity, um, a, a viability in complexity, stability in complexity. And it's as simple as that. So you can yeah, apply but, but it. The issue, the issue is that you, if, if you, with, depending upon which paradigm you tie it to, that then you, yeah. you interpret the complexity Sorry, I was, differently. I was going to finish. It's the other way around. The, the paradigms all provide a window into the VSM. 
you can yeah, apply yeah. you can apply those paradigms which is exactly what you've done yeah you can yeah. apply so all you're looking at is stability and complexity and all of those paradigms are trying to do the same but they're all part of a smaller picture um, the vsm provides you with a very very good overview of all of those things um, so you're looking for coherence in your structures you're looking for cohesion so i apply the vsm to understanding art um, and what is art, but I can equally apply it to an organization. What's, what's more important is to understand how it differs when you apply those philosophies. Um, mm. And the big problem I have with management cybernetics, and not a problem of, of the philosophy, is that with organizations, people sit in the structures that we talk about. So you have the managing director who sits in system five, and when you use the VSM for art, to understand art, you, you don't have that. You, you may put the artist in a particular place. But in doing that, the organization, using the organizations are themselves interesting as social structures because we place people into the different functions um, and they become part of the system itself and adopt, adopt that. But I felt it was much um, an activism and um, critical realism deserve a mention. Yeah, 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 they probably do. Interesting. I think in that discussion, uh, somebody was putting up the discussion, uh, discussion, the argument between Ulrich and um, uh, uh, and, and Stafford, yeah. and uh, and I think in that there's discussion about people taking on roles in organizations rather than being people. And therefore you can talk about it more in terms of a, a model and more scientifically. I don't know whether we'd have held to that in other, in other. Well, role, for me, it's very simple. A role is how an organization achieves stability with different people coming in. They behave in the manner of the role. Yeah. Um, I think Raoul covered that in several of his papers. Yeah. That's all. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, finally, I don't know if Marcus Schoeninger or Jose Pedagios want to make a final comment. You've been making suggestions in the chat. Marcus? I'm here, yes. Uh, yes, thank you for inviting me for, for a comment. I have uh, seen this uh, polarity between pol uh, pol positivism and structuralism. And uh, <clears throat> I'm very much aware of that, and I think that uh, uh, I discussed that a lot with Stafford, uh, and Stafford says, you needn't think that the Norbert Wien or I are so naive that we are on one, in one corner, which is the positivist one. And so I think we should be aware of, of, of the different paradigms of the different methodologies uh, and uh, not not limit ourselves. I don't argue here that you can or should combine everything, but I think it's actually I, I put a, a little paper on the chat uh, for you, which is coming from actually from um, from Mike's uh, journal, System Research and Behavioral Science, and there I, I show a, I call it the complementarity framework, which puts a light on the variety of, each, of, of paradigms and methodologies and argues for keeping them rather together in a kind of integrative methodology. And I actually, I hold each polarity with a rubber band mentally. You know? So we have a series of rubber bands between polar opposites, quantitative, qualitative, positivist and uh, interpretivist. Uh, structuralist versus discursive and, and things like that. And so, I mean, that's just what I want to contribute. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in that, and especially to, to my group. It was terrific to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, Jose, any final comment? And we will close. Yeah, well, the, the, the first thing I wish to say is also, uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, because it's quite uh, interesting uh, to have this opportunity to exchange ideas with so many people in, around the world. Uh, in, 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 so well focused in an in a issue like is the biosystem uh, model. And so my, my two uh, reflect, final reflections would be just to 
simplify, uh, is uh, first, uh, the viable system model is so rich that um, when we start to talk about parts of it, we get swamped in huge debates like happen, happened today. Um, the, the first part of the of the 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 the, 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 the presentation uh, when um, uh, Mark, uh, Mike and Raul uh, were debating about the uh, soft system methodology approach or the by plan uh, uh, with the by this is just a small portion of a piece the one of the first pieces of the application of the whole approach we could have this, this same discussion going inside the model in other areas of it and get swamped in the huge debates because he's so rich in content that uh, this is normal that happens so this is not something bad <laughs> it's it, in fact it's a proof of the huge power the second reflection I would like to make is that the combination of uh, methodologies, I know that there are debates about the uh, incommensurability because they are uh, belonging to different paradigms, etc. Okay, I, I agree with that. But I, I also, from the pragmatic point of view, because I come from the, in, the engineering uh, world from, from the, in the past, uh, working with, uh, in companies, etc., um, I'm looking for something that may help managers to have a better life, if that is possible, and to face huge problems of huge complexity in a way that is acceptable uh, and possible. And also, and particularly, uh, to be able to communicate with other managers. Here is the other point where I, I think that the viable system model is tremendously powerful. Once the managers have the elements, the basic um, components of the viable system model is relatively fast to exchange information among them uh, in relation to a certain problem, because they have the language. For instance, the idea of dividing in the second step of, of my approach uh, in, in the case of applying the methodology, the, in the second step, you made the unfolding of complexity uh, and you create the vertical structure with all the recursion levels and with all the the recursion criteria that you may enrich and make it more complicated, but more rich. But uh, forgetting the, the, the criteria, just only one criteria. You have the recursion levels, and at each level, you have all the components of the viable system model with all the purposes, with all the in, in components, with all the stakeholders, with all the communication channels, with all the actions, and a myriad of components in each of the recursion levels. This, when you don't have this tool, this, in the reality, this happens. The managers have to talk about different recursion levels, but since they don't have a tool to communicate, it's a mess. Uh, I have a good example of the uh, president of my university uh, in that he, uh, by the way, uh, he was, he's a mathematician and he, uh, uh, I was a member of his uh, team, of the rectoral team. And he asked me only one book of organizational theory because he as the rector and president of the university, by the way, the University of Valladolid is the oldest university of the Spanish speaking world together with Salamanca. It's from the 12th century. This is just incidental, just to make a comment of where we are. And also the other observation of the university is that, that the last speech that Stafford Vier gave was in the University of Valladolid when he got the uh, honoris causa investment. Uh, he was invested at honoris causa. And the speech that he pronounced, uh, the title is, What is Cybernetics? I say that because it's quite interesting that you uh, have a look to this paper that he uh, presented in Valladolid, just to explain uh, the last time, because it was the last speech that he gave because after he died, what is cybernetic? Well, anyway, if, forgetting this historical comment, uh, the, the, the thing that I, I, I consider uh, so valuable for the viable system model is that the managers, once they have the uh, common language that the viable system provides, they may uh, communicate well with the other managers. In the case of this president of the university, uh, when he asked me the, the only one book of organizational theory, I gave him the brain of the firm. And uh, something like half a year later, 
Uh, I was talking with him and he asked, hey, what about the book? How did you, did you find the book? Uh, um, this person is a mathematician, one of the most relevant in the world, in uh, discrete mathematics, etc. He's, he's a very uh, top level scientific. And I was afraid that he was going to say, well, this is a, a come on. Uh, something very easy, it's, it's trivial, it's a bunch of, of, um, of, of biases. And, uh, and the, the, this is what I was afraid of, uh, of listening. And what he told me was, this is the most difficult book I ever read. So I, I cannot understand that. How can that be? I was shocked. And uh, in these discussions, what we see are components of this difficulty. We just got stuck in one of the, of the parts that is the first part of the applying the methodology that is defining the identity. Before we start to apply the model, we have to define the, the identity, define the purpose. And this is the most difficult question for any organization is, what is your organization and what is your purpose? This is the most difficult to answer. But if you don't answer that question, what comes after is useless because what are you going to design if you did not clarify what are you and what is the purpose of your organization and to answer that we need help from other approaches and here is where mike <laughs> i call for other approaches subsystem methodology by plan whatever we need help because it's true the viable system model does not give you the the tools to solve that, provide some elements. For instance, this integrity uh, could help to um, getting um, a variety of people uh, focusing a certain issue, so it could help. No? Uh, but we need uh, uh, from a, a variety of, of, of uh, methodologies. And this combination, uh, I think that can be done with, without conflict. For instance, I put on the chat a uh, paper that is a, a, a paper that uh, Marcus Vanninger and, and myself published in, in the System Dynamics Review, where we show how the system dynamics, which is one of the very well-developed systemic methodologies uh, that, that uh, Mike uh, puts on the group of the uh, uh, structural complexity. Uh, and uh, this, this uh, methodology has its own life with its own scientific community. There are several thousands of practitioners all over the world. And the, and the cybernetic organization and the biosem is another community. Well, in this paper, we show how these two methodologies should be combined in certain situations. Why is possible to combine them and why not only is possible, they should be combined. In fact, this was proposed already by Stafford Beer in Chile. Uh, of the components uh, that he created uh, uh, while he was working with Allende, one of the components was the system dynamics model that, uh, that uh, he uh, created with the help of Forrester and the Forrester team, which is a, a pure system dynamics model. So it's not something new. Beer himself, at the beginning, at the early years of applying it, use it. And this is, well, uh, an example of how to uh, combine uh, methodology, which I think uh, are useful. Uh, and that's the thing. Uh, and just to end up and not use more time, Angela, I just stop. Uh, the, the, my final observation is that uh, when uh, you show the viable system model to people, uh, at least the, the, the elements, uh, the metaphor I use is the, the cataratas. I don't know in English how you say cataratas. <laughs> you may help me in the translation. Uh, <laughs> like, what the, eh? what the, no, but what the, but the ice, the ice falls. <laughs> when, you see the world blurry. You remove the, the cataratas and you put a, a, a clear uh, cristalino and you, you start to see. Well, the viable system model for me is, is a metaphor. Eh? helps you to see um, the, the work in a relatively, relatively a more um, simplified way. It, summarizing is a communication tool for managers that may save huge amounts of time uh, having conversations. 
the, the, the example of the, the expression that I was mentioning, uh, one way he was using the viable system model is when he had conversation with the vice rectors and the, with the vice presidents, when they, they had the meetings, he commented me that the issues that they were uh, throwing were issues of different recursion levels. So when they started to jump into a discussion, different issues, one was economic, the other was of administrative, the other was educational, the other was research, etc., etc. What he uh, asked them is, stop a moment, let's clarify in which recursion level are we. Once we agree that we are in this uh, specific recursion level, we continue the conversation. And that saved a lot of time because otherwise they were mixing problems, strategic problems, long range, with solving a problem of a roof in a building, all mixed up. So uh, I think that is a tremendous useful tool uh, to help managers. And particularly uh, government, governmental organizations, not only companies, because we put the focus on companies, but for instance, thinking the virus and the coronavirus uh, and the, the huge complexity that the problem of the virus uh, has, uh, there is a, a, a good work of, um, uh, of, of uh, Mike Jackson that he just uh, 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 presented the published recently about the, the coronavirus. It's a good example of the tremendous complexity. Uh, the biosystem model may help a lot if you use it for the different levels of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the country, uh, the central government, the, the, um, the autonomous communities, the uh, health the, the, the directorates, the health centers, the doctors, etc. It clarifies the different elements and it clarifies the communication structure that we didn't talk about it, that is necessary for this huge organism made up of organisms made up of organisms may operate and work proper. Well, I stop here, Angela, sorry for using very much, too much time, uh, but uh, Angela, yeah. that's it. thank you. Every time I listen to Jose for any amount of time, I need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, oh, I want to raise, I want to raise this glass. I only have <laughs> I want to raise this glass to all of you, but unfortunately, it's just a background. So I'm going to have to go downstairs for a beer. <laughs> but I do, I do toast you all and thank you for the engagement, which has been great. Thank you, Mike. It's been a really interesting um, webinar. Thank you very much. And um, well, before we go, uh, just a few announcements. First of all, our conference, the, conf the Metaforum conference in Belgium that was planned for the 13th of June. Uh, we're going to have to postpone it with the new variant of the coronavirus in the UK. Most of us are not sure that we will be able to travel. But we have decided to postpone it and we will announce it uh, shortly. Uh, the next uh, series of uh, webinars is going to be announced also in the next uh, week or so. Uh, and uh, uh, we are receiving uh, proposals for this year's webinar. So if any one of you is interested in offering a webinar, please send us um, a proposal, okay? So I don't know, Mike, if you want to say any final words or shall we uh, close now? <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. We will um, re put the, recorder, uh, the recording in the Metaform website. Thank you very much and thank you, Mike. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Have a nice